Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I will speak about uh, genetics in a literary sense, and you may ask what do you mean uh, by that, and I think that uh, a lot of presentations in the previous uh, conferences were about the Human Genome Project or gene editing, and I'm now using genetics as also uh, what purposes lawyers can use um, uh, genetic identifications, profiling, and what are the legal controversies when we take genetics in this literary sense, what are the human rights obstacles, what are the consequences, and what are the advantages, of course. Um, textuality of the genetics is a, is a puzzle, and of course it can be understood as a metaphorical sense, and it can be also understood as an important tool. It has been introduced by Sheila Jason of uh, but if you compare the two illustrations, I'm sure as lawyers you recognized uh, and doctors both of them. One is the ancient Hammurabi code, which we can read, and lawyers, we are masters of coding and interpreting text. But we, more and more we have to interpret what is on the right side of the slide of genetic data, and it is, can be also used in more as a text, and we are reading and identifying. This is a very new epoch. I don't want to be unfair to life sciences, but textuality in life sciences of a much recent vintage, in compared with five millennia of law writing, the association of biology with written text occupies just in a blink in time, but its implications for human rights and entitlements have been no less momentous. This is also what Sheila Gisanov speaks about, these two types of textuality, textuality in law and textuality in life sciences. So where this genetic textuality come from? Uh, we have to go back in 1953, when Francis Crick's and James Watson's pu uh, published the uh, double helix, the structure of the double helix, and since then it has become, of course, more uh, concrete, more accurate. Uh, I don't want to go to the long history of the Human Genome Project, first genetic testing, screening, genetic identifications. I would like to focus on those aspects which are interesting for forensic and legal and human rights perspectives. Of course, legislators all around the world and uh, organizations, international organizations, uh, try to react for this type of new use of genetic data. The public was very much concerned about of reductionism, stigmatization, discrimination. So there were uh, several legal instruments have been adopted for protecting of humans uh, for a too wide use of genetic data or too restrictive or reductionist view of genetic data. And through the genetic data uh, contain very unique information about not only about the data subject, but also about relatives, and also highlighting of significance of belonging to a group, and it's also uh, challenging our notion of privacy, paternity, belonging to the group, and many others. So these are two um, sources which I refer to. Uh, I actually had uh, intimate relations with both of the documents as I worked on both of them in different capacities. In 1997, the Human Declaration of Human Genome and Human Rights by UNESCO and 2003, the International Declaration of Human Genetic Data. The first document uh, uh, from 1997, actually the one which developed a lot of legal innovations, including of um, discrimination based on genetic origins, which have been later used in several other documents, but it was a completely new focus, and also how to protect of uh, genetic data, how much does it belong to the uh, kind of uh, common heritage framework, and how much does it belong to of a privacy framework to the individual. European Union had endless sources in which they address of our genetic identity and our genetic uh, profile of an individual, not to mention the most important uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union already included, but also in the Council of Europe, Oviedo Convention, uh, also the very important uh, notion of the data protection. I will just briefly show a slide about the new data protection regulation in Europe also identified what is genetic data. 
Uh, when we're speaking about the fallacies and potential errors, because one hand we could see that we have such a magnificent instrument of genetic data we can use for identification, profiling, paternity uh, doubts, we can use for family unification. So what's the problem with that? And then we can identify many uh, issues, and I refer here to the Oviedo Convention, which is also saying, and if you're looking at this instrument, the human dignity is much broader than just to, uh, to reduct someone on their genetic origins. And you could see there are several places when there is a clash between of, of personal identity and uh, or the notion of belonging to a group or a family and a genetic identity. Uh, also, in terms of research, the Oviedo Convention says that the human being shall prevail over the sole interest of society and science. So I still try to emphasize that the individual is more important than even in case of uh, collecting data. This is a response in, in many times for collecting mass data without knowing uh, the details for what purposes we shall use. Uh, we have to bear in mind Article 2 of the Oviedo Convention. And discrimination is also of uh, mentioned in several documents. In 1997, the UNESCO Universal Declaration of Human Genome and Human Rights, the Oviedo Convention. One particular uh, reference can be found in Article 12 in predictive genetic testing, which I think it's very important to bear in mind that it's restricting the predictive genetic testing for health and scientific purposes. Many times we think we can use for predictions for all kind of uh, purposes, but actually according to the Council of Europe documents, predictive testing has a very restrictive use and of course it has to be linked with genetic consultations. I promise that I will show just a reference how much genetic data became of a standard focus of thinking that it's also in the European data protection regulation very complicated way they try to um, define what genetic data is and in a very broad sense. And I don't want to go into details that these documents identify genetic data. Actually, it's somewhat different form. Uh, uses of genetic data is also manifold, and I, I'm sure that my list is far from being exhaustive. Uh, so we can use for... Uh, Profiling, for instance, to make predictions. Um, we can use it for biomedical research. We can use for identifications, for biobank research, linking different sources of uh, data. Uh, identification is also much broader now. It's uh, used for also immigration purposes, forensic, post-war accidents, paternity, maternity testing, uh, also family unifications. Uh, genetic ancestry tracing is also used. Many of them had, some of them of this list has legal implications. Some of them are used for more broader social use. For instance, if you think that um, traditional identity is unrelated to genetics, you might be wrong because the, even indigenous groups are using, in some cases, genetic data to establish of, of identity of a group, such as the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma used uh, of a certain genetic uh, testing, and he said that has to have at least one eight Seminole uh, genetic uh, ancestry in the blood to be considered to be part of the group. This is very different than cultural and legal identity. In, in a previous documents, when simply people consider that they are associated with the group and that's the identity. And um, sometimes it's used for justice purposes. For instance, there is a project, on, of course, on a voluntary basis, that African Americans who are looking for their genetic lineage, they are offered of a help by geneticians who would always this, uh, uh, try to have uh, identify their ancestry lines using genetic tests. Not to mention a most lit, uh, recent example when 23 and Me offered help for families where the babies were placed in baby prisons in US, and uh, in order to identify who belongs to whom, they also use genetic testing for these purposes. So genetics can bring justice to people. It can create also of belonging to of a certain group, but of course it poses um, a lot of uh, challenges. I hope I can, yeah. So um, 
For no wonder that many uh, prominent lawyers, according to Attorney General John Ashcroft, called genetics as a truth machine. But is it a truth machine? In many times, it seems that it's, it helps to answer certain questions, but not for all questions. The first uses in many countries, if you're looking at the jurisdictions of the European Court of Human Rights, they were uh, the early genetic cases were related to paternity testing. When, um, potential or assumed fathers didn't want to show up for DNA testing. There were Croatian, Polish, and several cases from actually from Central Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, then the court recognized and stated in several cases, for instance, the Mikulic versus Croatia or the Sharapov versus Poland case, that uh, the identity of the child, including this genetic identity, belongs to the protection of private and family life understood within Article 8 of the European Human Rights uh, uh, Convention. And this is of a very fundamental change because we allow of uh, genetics also as a part of previously understood as legal identity. But we know it's a part because it's constituting, for instance, paternity. The other landmark case is also well known, so I'm just very briefly uh, mentioning the Marper case. Marper case was of a, of a criminal case in which, uh, although two people were not convicted and the end, nevertheless, their DNA samples were retained in UK and they challenged this uh, retention without of a time limitation because they think that for further use they can be uh, more uh, included in further uh, criminal cases and they, in a discriminatory way they will be more included in further investigations. And the big challenge in front of the court was that what is the genetic data, what is the samples and before, uh, in Europe, uh, some countries consider this is just a material, others they consider the same as genetic information and, and uh, data. And the court case in Obitar Dicta said it's the same as actually it's even more sensitive source of data of the sample because we can derive further information from the sample. So the DNA profile, according to the UK government, they wanted to protect, and it's almost all scientific innovation in the beginning, they want to emphasize it's merely technical. It's like a barcode. Nothing uh, will be harmed. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a technical matter. While the court didn't accept this reasoning and consider that DNA profile and samples do do belong to the person's identity and this is very important and it should be protected within article 8 of the european uh, convention on human rights just as a marper case for uh, europe um, the simpson case was very important for um, us to understand of how what are the limitations of using genetic data in criminal charges and criminal cases um, it was very interesting that the defense uh, hired uh, such molecular biologists who were experts in how the genetic test should be made. And actually, although they successfully challenged the way how genetic uh, data have been used in a Simpson case, as a side effect of this case, they helped to enhance the methodology of using genetic data in forensic and criminal uh, cases. They tested actually the accuracy and they claimed something which that time was actually not available to have a statistical methods which were developed that, to, that they can accurately measure the probability of a match. But um, it's interesting in the case, uh, this is one of the illustration how the, in a, in a case they wanted to challenge the um, uh, use of genetic data, but genetic data was already so powerful in the case and uh, the failure to show the statistical methods how the random or uh, match could have been justified in a case actually led to the jury to ignore very important evidence, including, for instance, the uh, that they found the blood um, in the shoes uh, which uh, Simpson was wearing. So the challenging of genetic testimony is almost as old as using genetic testimony in uh, cases. And there were several scientific tests. What is the threshold of using a uh, genetic test? For instance, it's not even enough that in a peer-reviewed journal um, would mention of a, of a method of using uh, genetic data. It's not uh, qualified as, as a test. 
Um, so um, DNA um, testing and the defense uh, using of uh, molecular biologists were quite successful in casting doubts over the DNA evidence in that particular case. Uh, so that even non-genetic evidence uh, was ignored and neutralized by the case. Uh, uh, then the Cardozo School also had an innocence project, which was uh, very interesting in uh, 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 stating and uh, putting people out of the prison using of genetic testing. I would like to have um, the point on what is the genetic identifications for used, and it's very important, I think, whether it's used for cohesive or divisive identity when it's using profiling. As we are very much behind the schedule, I try to uh, skip the uh, fallacies and distorting effects of the legal interpretation of genetic data. There are many of them, actually. Uh, for instance, uh, just to uh, mention one interesting example of uh, uh, genetic reductionisms and uh, racial and uh, gender bias in Orchomenos uh, case was very interesting in Greece when uh, they found out that the Roma population uh, is not uh, developing sickle cell anemia and therefore that's related to a kind of racial identity and it turned out it's related to the history of that geographical history of that area because there was a huge lake uh, in uh, which dried out and uh, because there was a malaria, malaria very prominent in that area the local population uh, uh, didn't uh, was contaminated by the uh, later coming Roma population was not, so actually it was not a, of a gender um, and not a racial uh, component in that. So this um, area which I try to cross uh, shorter, uh, the cross-linking is another problematic area in uh, using genetic evidence. One of the famous cases is the uh, murder case of Anna Lind. Uh, in this case, the they, uh, investigators used the phenylketonuria database, and that's uh, for human rights lawyers another interesting challenge because of the phenylketonuria database, the Guthrie cards are used exclusively for um, uh, health purposes. Nevertheless, here um, they used of a sample found in the crime scene. She was uh, stabbed to death in uh, daylight in a shopping center. She was a minister of foreign affairs and they had a suspect of the perpetrator and they compared the two uh, databases and um, they found out that uh, they were right. And Mialovic, who was a second generation living in uh, Sweden, so uh, uh, he was already, his blood sample was already taken. It was a match, so they could use for identification. And they got a court order to do that. As, but since then, even in Sweden, they are discussing whether it was a right way to, uh, uh, to cross-linking these two cases. It was very different, and telling the cultural and legal differences in countries are very prominent. Again, I'm skipping many cases. I had a huge collection of such cases. But um, the Dutch Guthrie card case uh, is uh, somewhat similar than the Fenelkotonuria database was used in Sweden. Here, it was uh, a fire war, a war house which exploded. And um, they, to the biggest surprise to the people, in Netherlands, uh, the police very easily identified the victims. And of course, because of explosion, they couldn't use the regular ways of identification. And um, when they um, identified the uh, victims, it turned out that they used uh, the Guthrie card database, and they came with a list. The whole Dutch population was shocked, and they have to make a new law and they decided to try to finish, but we were very much behind the schedule. And, um, and they decided um, to destroy the Guthrie cards after a certain period of time. So they had to make a completely different arrangement than in Sweden and elsewhere, and they have to destroy the Guthrie card database than that. I'm sorry because I uh, wanted just really to, before finishing, to mention of a case which is very important for this topic of genetic and legal identity and showing what could go wrong. This is the Hebron case, in the German case, when they found that uh, in 40 crime scenes, they found the same DNA 
and terrible crimes were committed, but in not one uh, point, but in several parts in, uh, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, Germany, and then uh, they profiled the perpetrator. They knew it's a woman. They knew the person is moving a lot. So they targeted the Roma minority because they thought that the profile matches with the Roma minority. It could be a Roma who is wandering around in Central Eastern Europe and Germany and a Roma woman. And it turned out that they were wrong because that the swab, cotton swab was contaminated by a Polish guest worker who was working in the company. So at the end, they had to apologize for the Roma and Sinti minority because they profiled them using, of course, racial biases, also biases of certain minorities, assuming that someone from them could be the perpetrator. Since uh, the time left, and unfortunately, I couldn't uh, refer to many other cases and also how it's used for immigration policy, the genetic identification, so I have to jump to the uh, conclusion. I wanted to make a distinction between two types of genetic identification. One is when the use of a match uh, on a, based on a legitimate court proceedings and not cross-linking the data with scientific data. In contrast, when it's based on profiling, when there is no suspect, but from the material which they found on the crime scene or which they try to use, then they try to imagine the person who might be the perpetrator. And then it seems that we still use old racial ethnic criteria and which can go against the human rights principle. So we have, I don't say that it, it can never be used, but we have to be extremely cautious when we're using this profiling because based on the existing cases, which we already have, it can go wrong. Also, um, I think that we have to use distinction between cohesive and adhesive use. So when we include someone into the community, when it's used for access research and when excluding someone, when it's uh, for use for immigration purposes. All these things are not just theoretical. I told that I will open you the genetic data in a literary sense, and uh, in, I promised in the beginning, but I think that um, it's not just a theoretical discussion. Several countries, including Germany and elsewhere, they are discussing how to use genetic profiling, ethnic profiling for forensic purposes. And it, it's very important ethical and legal issues that we include bioethical and human rights components in this identification. So thank you very much for your attention.